recorder right now. Um, and we might have to spill over the lecture into the lab time a little bit today. By how much, I cannot say ahead of time because it really depends on you know, how much time it takes to explain uh, the concepts and you know, what kind of questions I'm getting in this class. <clears throat> so the first thing we need to do is to really look at the C code. The C code, by the way, does compile, okay? You know, because as you can see, I just copied and pasted the online GDB comments. <clears throat> so the program actually ran in uh, online GDB. So the first thing is to take a look at the structure, which is from line 12 to line 16 in the C code. So we have a struct X definition. It has two members. The first member is just a 8-bit unsigned integer value of i. The second member is a pointer to a struct X. Both are just one byte wide in, uh, in text toy processor. So, <clears throat> and that's why in the assembly language code, from line three to line five, we see that we are defining the offsets to member I, the offset to member P, and also the overall size of struct X as, as these labels. So do we have any questions about the, uh, the way structures work in C or the way I translate you know, structures into assembly uh, program concepts? <clears throat> it's all good? All right. All right, so in the C code, uh, we also see there's a global variable called printer. So the concept of volatile is not super important in this class. Uh, volatile in a strange way is telling the compiler um, and say, don't optimize, okay? If we have multiple you know, statements trying to access you know, the variable printer, do not optimize those accesses because otherwise the compiler can be pretty smart and say, oh, you're adding one first and then you're subtracting one, so that means end ending up not doing anything. And it can potentially just optimize everything out. <clears throat> and having volatile as a keyword is telling the compiler not to do any optimization. That is usually needed in order for um, things that can happen in the background, like interrupt surface subroutines, you know, signal handlers, and that sort, of that sort of stuff, as well as multi-threaded programs to work properly if they have to share global variables. But in this class, you know, we'll just you know, kind of ignore you know, all of that stuff and just say that printer is a global variable. So we have a cond con uh, function, which is you know, just here you know, because I want to see if you guys can translate the code you know, accordingly using a function call as a condition of a while loop. That's basically just the, <clears throat> just the reason why I'm putting cond here. And then we have the actual traverse um, subroutine. The actual traverse subroutine has a loop. The condition of the loop is a call to cond p. And then inside the loop here, we are changing printer for each iteration based on the i member of the structure that p is pointing to. And then we update the local, uh, not local, we're updating the parameter p to member p of the structure that parameter p is pointing to. So the name of using p, you know, as both the name of the parameter and the name of the member was intentional because I want to see whether you guys get confused or not. Hopefully not, but you know, those two are referring to different things. So by the time we get to this code, we'll find out, you know, what they are. And then we have three global variables uh, that are initialized. They are C, B, and A. So these three lines in C code from line 34 to line 36 are corresponding to the assembly code from line 10 all the way to line 18. Is that okay so far? So we can see how, you know, in uh, C code, all you have to do is to specify the value of the members <clears throat> in the order of the definition of the members and it will go to the right member you know, when, you, when it is initialized. Main doesn't do much. Main, all main does is to call traverse with the address of A as a parameter. And then in the C code here, let me see if I did, I mean in the assembly code, sorry. So in the assembly code, I already gave you the main program doing exactly the same thing. So, so main has, main is already done. 
and let me see whether cond is done or not. So cond is also done. Um, we can start with the discussion of cond, um, and then we can go ahead and implement traverse. So what do you guys want to do? Do you want to go over cond, uh, the, the implementation of cond first, or do you want to go straight to the implementation of traverse? Okay. All right, so cond is already done uh, in the zip file that you were provided with. Cond was already there. So cond, according to the way we define it in C, does not have any local variables. So the local variable size of cond is zero. <clears throat> cond underscore P is the number of bytes to find parameter P within cond. So that is just one byte away from um, all the local variables, but we have no local variables, but we still have to account, the one, account for the one byte that is the return address. So the first two, these two lines here, line 23 and line 24, they are here to initialize or to allocate the space on the stack for local variables. We do, we do not have any, okay? So it's really doing absolutely nothing to the stack pointer. And then when we get to here, it's deallocating the space used for local variables. And once again, we really do not have any local variables. And as a result, you know, it doesn't do anything either. So within the body of the loop, uh, within the body of cond, all I do is to load the value of parameter P into register A. That is sufficient already. Because, you know, in the C code, we are saying, you know, um, is it true that P does not equal to zero? Okay, <clears throat> so if you just return p or the value of p itself, it does satisfy what not equal to zero means, because you know, anything that is non-zero is interpreted as true in C or C++. So cond does not need to return a one or a zero, depending on whether p is you know, non-zero or not. It can just return p all by itself. Okay. So it's kind of like a, it's not really a trick per se. It really is, you know, just using the uh, assumption in C as a programming language. And C++ borrow a lot of that from C as well. I remember reading it, I was like, <clears throat> yeah, that, that, it's, 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 it's doing its job, but it's doing it differently. Right, so in Java, it would have been a little bit different because in Java, um, P does not equal to zero would not match the return type of an 8-bit unsigned integer. In Java, the compiler would have complained and say your return, your actual return expression is, is a Boolean value, but yet the return type is a non-Boolean, and it would actually complain about it and consider that not as a warning, but as an error. So, but in C, you know, there's no such thing as a Boolean type, so integers are basically doubling as you know, Boolean types. <clears throat> so that's kind of the quick explanation of cond. So now we'll go ahead and implement traverse. I'm not sure whether traverse has a label. I think we do. Nope, okay, so traverse doesn't even have a label defined. Let me just look for that one more time. Nope, okay, which is fine. So what we need to do is to define traverse now. So traverse, this is the entry point. And as usual, the first thing I want to do is to um, take a look at what is supposed to be on the stack. So on the stack, we have parameters.